Welcome to Poplar Bluff, where the Mississippi Delta meets the Ozarks. Poplar Bluff is the capital of Butler County in rural southeast Missouri. Here, you can go for a swim in Lake Wapapello, hike in the Mark Twain National Forest, or enjoy the numerous rivers. This idyllic spot in Missouri's boot heel is a dream for many of its residents. For the rest, that dream is a nightmare. Meth and heroin run rampant in these parts. Poverty level here is one of the highest in the United States. Homeless camps are scattered and hidden in the forests. This is a place where two drivers can hit and kill a 13-year-old girl, then flee the scene. The first driver gets sent to jail, and the second driver, a well-connected banker on his way home from a bar, walks away unscathed. It's a place where graffiti is treated as a terroristic threat. Overseeing it all are the Butler County Sheriff and the Poplar Bluff Police Department. Here, what passes for justice depends on who you know and how much is in your bank account. Under Police Chief Danny Whiteley, the police have helped their friend get away with shooting a woman in the chest at point-blank range. Because we all know you and all friends with you, you know, jet. Officers accused of sexual assault are still on the force. Things are no better under Sheriff Mark Dobbs. Dobbs leaves bodies to decompose in ponds instead of giving families closure. Get my son out of this water. Let me lay him to rest. The Sheriff's Department won't even look at a crime if the victim has ever used drugs. They said she was a druggie, so, you know, she's just another one gone, more or less. Despite the high number of shootings in the area, one of the most dangerous places in all of Butler County is the Butler County Jail, run by Sheriff Dobbs. This is my son, Adam. He broke a window here in this town. Take it up a fence, it's a misdemeanor. They take him to jail and lock him up. Within 12 hours of arresting him, he was dead. They took him in the holding cell. Three of them went in there, put him in a strangulation hole, and was beating him. Stuck a pair of socks in his mouth, and he strangled to death and died. All three of them pulled his limp, lifeless body out of the holding cell, across the booking room, into the drunk tank where they hung him up, and swore from now he committed suicide. When victims and families come forward to share their stories of abuse and neglect, they are met with a phalanx of reactionary forces, even going so far as to drown out a prayer circle with their taunts and chants. To almost 100 people here today for Thanksgiving. That's common sense. Okay. If that makes you feel good, good. It don't make me feel good. My son's dead. I want justice I for him. What justice? What justice? On December 11, 2019, Donald Harold III was booked into the Butler County Jail. By the 15th, he was dead. According to the Butler County Sheriff, he had been seen by a doctor in the emergency room prior to incarceration and was deemed fit for confinement. He was deemed fit for confinement, but was being housed by himself despite having no issues with jail staff or other detainees. The autopsy report stated that Donald died of a fatal upper respiratory infection. He died of an upper respiratory infection, yet was deemed fit for confinement. The official story is that he died on the shower floor while getting ready for a court appearance. If his infection was so serious that it killed him, how was he expected to stand and take a shower, let alone go to court? Coroner at the time, Andrew Moore, who is currently under indictment on charges of theft, had the audacity to say that Donald's death had nothing to do with him being incarcerated in the Butler County Jail. However, according to witnesses, a guard was yelling at and beating Donald while he lay on the shower floor, possibly already dead. He screamed taunts and profanities at Donald, ordering him to get up and take his shower. The guard then shuts the bathroom door and leaves for five to 10 minutes. The guard re-enters the bathroom and closes the door when the door reopens, Donald is now sitting slumped on the toilet. At this point, the witnesses can see that Donald's toenails are turning purple and blue. The guard then opens the door, flashes his flashlight at Donald, then calls out to someone named Dave for help. Dave enters the bathroom, strikes Donald, and tells him to wake up. Donald was then dragged off the toilet and laid on the floor. It was then that the witnesses observed blood running out of Donald's nose. The officers finally began to attempt resuscitation. 
However, it was too late. The witnesses then had a cover put over their door and they were denied the ability to make any phone calls. It was me and a girl. Her name's Desiree Lodo. We was together. We got into a little argument. So she runs across the street from my sister's house and starts staying with them. The girl never told me I couldn't come over to her property to talk to her. I was constantly back and forth for like a few days looking to talk to Desiree. So this last day on the uh, 26th, she pulls up and I go to talk to her, you know, and I'm just trying to find out if, if, if our whole relationship is over at that time so I could just go my way. And she started laughing like it was funny. So I got a little loud with her. Once I get loud with her, her, Tiara, the girl that lives in this apartment in housing, and her sister, they all rush out the door pushed me off the porch. That's when I broke my ankle. So I try to get up and walk across the street and notice my whole foot was turned sideways and calls the police. So I, police gets there. They go talk to her. They go, they talk to me. I'm in the ambulance at this time. They tell me I need to go down and have surgery. So they rush me to the hospital to go get surgery. So while I'm there waiting for surgery, a policeman comes in and does a report and I told the officer what happened, you know, that's what he was asking and that was that. They didn't arrest me or nothing after that, so. I say a few months after my surgery, maybe a month or two, I leave and go back to Illinois. That's where he came back and we left together and went back to Illinois. So I come back probably right at Christmas time of 2019. And I get here and and me and Desiree get in another dispute and Papa Bluff police is called. And they pull up on scene. They tell me that I have a warrant. So I don't have a warrant for it. It was like for a, what, a failure to appear or something like that. And I'm like, for what? And they was talking about the 2018 thing. And I'm like, well, she dropped that. Well, she went and dropped that, period. They didn't even look that up. You know what I'm saying? And it was like, well, the state picked it up so she couldn't drop it like that. That's what he told me. So I'm like, okay, I got all these illnesses. Before you take me to jail, is there a nurse on staff when I get down there? And he said, yes. So when I get down there, there's no nurse on staff. Uh, I didn't see a nurse come in there until like Sunday morning. When she came in, I still didn't get to see her. But it was that Friday afternoon when I went in and I started realizing that I'm losing my breath. I know what was going to happen. And my diabetic seizure started kicking in. And I'm like, what do I do? There's a lot of people in there. And I'm like, what do I do? That's like press the panic button if you need medical treatment. So I started pressing the, the panic button. And the officer that was going to do this name is Jeff Lloyd. And I kept pressing the panic button, pressing the panic button, he come to me, no, you don't need no medical attention. You just having a panic attack because you're in jail. I'm like, why would I be pressing this and telling you I need medical treatment if it's just a panic attack? I know what's wrong with me. I, I'm begging this man. I'm like, you can call my family, ask my family, or call the hospital to see if they can just fax you my medical records up here so you can see that I'm not lying. I need medical treatment. You can take me to the hospital and bring me back here. I don't care. I just want to get medical treatment because I know I'm about to die. Nope. He didn't give me medical treatment. Kept on pushing that panic button. Boom, 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 boom to the point where it just started getting real serious and then like a few more times. Boom, boom, boom. I thought about for hours just pushing this panic button and to the point where he got tired of me and he just pulled me out of there. Took me back here and took my clothes off, put me in the padded room and then put me in a restraint chair. Started being racist and biased towards me and stuff. I'm, you know, I'm like, wow. You know, I'm sitting in that chair, restraint chair, and I'm like, Lord, I'm about to die. I'm just gonna die and ain't nobody gonna know what happened. You know what I'm saying? I was crying on the floor, crying and pressing this panty button. It's, you know, but thank God there is a guy because God brought me out of that. He knew what was going on. He said, you know what? I'm, I'm, I'm here for you, David, and I'm going to take care of you. You're going to get your justice one day. You know what to do because he know I know what to do.
I got high blood pressure, high blood pressure, I got ulcers, I have a degenerative disc, uh, L4, L5, for over 15, 20 years. I still ankle injury right here. Um, I actually committed suicide back in, I don't know, 2015. I was in a coma for three days. And that triggered a lot of my health issues, like the high blood pressure. And uh, some of the medications, like I take two different kinds of gabapentin, 800 milligrams. I had to take that three times a day. I take um, Remron, which that's 45 milligrams. Uh, Ratadine. I take 100 mil 150 milligrams of that. Zoloft, I had to take 200, I went from 50 milligrams of Zoloft to 200 milligrams of Zoloft. The Lacinopro for my high blood pressure. Hydrocodone for my back. The uh, Sterling, I think that's another one for uh, depression. I'm a, I'm a manic depression. I take three different types of uh, depression pills. Um, Metrazepine, take those, uh, 45 milligrams. In the three days that you were in the jail, were you, were you given access to any of your medications? None. So you went you went basically 72 hours, roughly, without medicine that you're supposed to take every day? Right. Okay. And, and it was actually even a, a guy in there that was a diabetic in a wheelchair. He was big legs. The nurse came in Sunday, she seen him right away. And then I asked, I asked Jeff, could I see her? And he told me no, that I wasn't seeing the nurse. And I never got to see the nurse. Which, like I say, I know God is real. I've been on the dark side before. So I know that's who brought me out of what I was going through. And I felt like when I got myself together here, got myself, my foundation said, you know, trying to get my life going, job, stuff like that, that I was going to take action to try to get justice for this. And, you know, it is crazy. It is something needs to be done about this, man. A, a lot of people, other people going to get hurt in the same way. On December 14th, 2020, Noah Burke was arrested for an alleged probation violation and taken to the Butler County Jail. His probation was not based on a prior conviction, but for failure to pay child support. By December 19th, he was dead. Noah's family has since filed a wrongful death lawsuit against the county, Sheriff Dobbs, and others who were involved. Noah may have had a history of drug abuse, but there is no evidence that he was intoxicated when arrested, and jail staff searched him and found no drugs or other contraband. For the first few days, Noah's incarceration was fairly uneventful. Then, on the 18th, jail staff noticed that he was acting strangely, sweating profusely, and disrobing. It was, or at least should have been, obvious that something was wrong. Instead of seeking medical treatment, Noah was placed in an observation room that many know as solitary. A few hours later, Guards noticed that he was acting even more strangely, including attacking the block walls of the cell and making wild threats. Again, failing to seek medical treatment, the guards instead put Noah in a restraint chair in a tiny room. Noah was handcuffed by his wrists and ankles to the chair. His arms, torso, and shoulders were strapped down, rendering him utterly helpless. The manufacturer of the restraint chair clearly states that detainees must be monitored and not left in the chair for more than two hours. The time limit can be extended, but only under medical supervision and for no more than an additional eight hours. It is believed that this is common practice within the Butler County Jail. In fact, not only was Noah strapped down in that chair, but the chair had been moved to an area without cameras. By the time the highway patrol arrived, the chair was back in its regular position. Noah was placed in the restraint chair at 4.30 in the afternoon. At no time during the 13 hours that Noah was trapped in that chair was he seen by any medical professionals, nor was he allowed exercises to stretch his limbs. He was never even allowed to use the restroom. At 7 a.m. the next morning, rookie officer Roy Bolen claims that he heard Noah talking 
but did not see him at that time. Officer Taylor Whiteley, son of the Poplar Bluff police chief, claims he saw Noah at 6 a.m. alive but high on something. However, Officer Lucas Nearman claims he found Noah unresponsive around 5.45, contradicting the claims of both Boland and Whiteley. EMS was on the scene at 7.30. EMS crew member Christopher Lawson thought it was odd that Noah had signs of rigor mortis, since that usually takes a substantial time to show. At 7.42, Noah was pronounced dead. An autopsy report concluded that it was likely he died from a drug overdose from meth and fentanyl, as no drugs or paraphernalia were found upon his booking. He must have received the drugs while incarcerated. It should have been obvious what was happening to Noah, but jail staff was either too undertrained to recognize the signs of an overdose or too callous to be bothered to do something about it. Had Noah been taken to the hospital in a timely manner, he would likely still be with us today. On April 30th, 2014, Adam Banks was arrested on a second degree misdemeanor charge for breaking a window. He was placed in the Butler County Jail. By noon the next day, Adam was dead. According to the Butler County Sheriff's Department and the coroner, Adam hung himself in his cell. A closer look shows their story does not hold up. This is Adam. Adam, Butch, Banks, Bright. Forever 31 now. Because Butler County Sheriff's Department beat and strangled him to death. And tried to cover it up by saying he hung himself in their drunk tank by committing suicide, which I have evidence and proof and eyewitnesses that prove different. When I came in at one o'clock to Adam's house, the neighbors told me the police had arrested him the night before. Okay. They were arrested him for property damage, for breaking a window. Okay. Which he did. He went down to a known heroin dealer's house who was giving his wife drug heroin and uh, found his stepson in the backyard where the, where the, where's, it wasn't even his wife, it's just his girlfriend, where her son was left in the backyard, a three or four year old little kid, for over eight hours alone in the heroin dealer's backyard because the mama didn't even know where he's at. So Adam went off. He was going to beat that heroin dealer's ass. Stop giving my old lady drugs, you son of a bitch, you need to be in jail. Well, he broke the dude's window, was going to yank the dude through the window, yep. He was going to beat his ass. Adam had every intention of beating his ass. Then his, the little boy, Eli, come around the corner. Daddy, Daddy, what are you doing? Adam stopped dead in his tracks, man. Grabbed hold of the kid and took him home. He done the right thing. And she said, you go get some fucking help. You get the hell out of here before I, before I kill you. Because you ain't leaving, no, you ain't doing this to your kid no more. Well, she called the cops and told the cops that Adam threatened to kill him. But she didn't tell the rest of the story. So here come the cops. They arrested Adam for breaking the window. And they hauled the, the girl and the kid off. All right? It's supposed to be a tickable defense. All right? When they took Adam to jail, they, they escorted him out of the house without handcuffs. According to two of the neighbors, two different neighbors. Okay? They were they were they were laughing, telling, you know, cutting up. He wasn't being disrespectful, it, you know, uncooperative or anything, or violent. I mean, they would have put him in handcuffs if he was. Set him down in a car and took him to jail. 12 hours later, he was dead. Six, uh, six o'clock the next morning, when Adam is still in the holding cell, not been booked in yet, nothing at the county jail. Robert Reed was waiting for his cohorts to get there. So this was premeditated, actually. Because he sat and studied and thought about it all night long. Thinking of what the hell he was going to do. He had to get his cohorts in there before he could do it. by Because he couldn't do it by himself. Alright. So he enlisted Adam Younger and David Light. And told them, hey, we've got Daniel Bright in here again trying to pass off as Adam Banks. Once again, so let's go beat the fuck out of him and make him confess who the hell he is. So that's what exactly what they done. 
They went off in the holding cell, grabbed my son up in the chokehold, Adam Younger did, because he's known as the chokehold king to everybody in Butler County. All right, he's the newbie on the block. He's trying to prove himself to be a big bad boy. And they stuffed a pair of socks in my son's mouth because they got tired of him saying, no. my sister hits harder than you do, motherfuckers. And he also made another statement that the eyewitness, uh, eye and ear witness next door and the, and the holding cell next door heard him say and scream, you stomp my bad foot, you son of a bitch, in which I've got the pictures to prove that from the autopsy report. And then she said that she saw him drag his wimp lifeless body out of the holding cell across the rotunda, the booking room, I mean, across the booking room into the drug tank where his limp, her, her words are, his limp lifeless body with his eyes half open. It took all three of them to drag his limp lifeless body across the booking room because it looked like he'd been in a, been in a fight with a semi truck and lost. And that's where they strung him up at. And uh, she said about 30 minutes later, they locked the whole jail down and it started smelling like bleach. For three days, it smelled like bleach, the whole damn jail. I've talked to several people that was incarcerated in the jail at the time. They said even back there, they was choking to death. They poured so damn much bleach trying to clean up everything. Yeah, from them murdering my son. It took them three hours, almost four hours before they ever got back with me from me calling them on the phone trying to find out where my son was. And finally they said, well, a detective call you in about 20 minutes. Well, I waited 20 minutes and I called him back. I said, I know you got my son. You better tell me where the fuck my son is and you better tell me now. And the, the cop on the other end said, well, your son's dead. He committed suicide and he succeeded. That's how I was told my son was dead from the Butler County Sheriff's Department. And that's just wrong. After three hours of calling him and him denying that my son is even there for somebody to come on there and tell me all hateful like that about my baby. Which he didn't commit suicide, they murdered him. And they had to have that time to try to cover up the brutally heinous crime. They went to my daughter-in-law's house, Danny's, Danny's wife, Tracy Bright, Sheriff Do Mark Dobbs, Quarter Acres, about 3.30 showed up at her apartment down in the housing project on the south side by a table lot down there. Knocked on her door and told her that her husband committed suicide, Danny Bright, committed suicide in their jail and uh, is dead. And she laughed at him. She said, my husband's not in your jail. He's in the uh, Charleston Penitentiary. I just talked to him. Then they had to go back and figure out who they'd murdered. <laughs> they didn't even know who they'd killed. Yeah, whenever I asked Akers about that, he swears up and down. I never went to Tracy Bright's house. How'd you know her name was Tracy? I said Danny's wife. How'd you know her name was Tracy Bright? If you hadn't been to her house, if you didn't know her. Well, he didn't want to answer that question. He was done talking then. Yeah, because they thought that Adam was Danny. Who Danny used Adam's name as an alias a lot of times here in Butler County. Which they could be mistaken for each other, but if they'd have done their damn job and fingerprinted Adam when they arrested him for breaking a window, the same thing they arrested Danny for a year earlier, they would have known there was two boys and not just one. And they wouldn't have made the mistake of killing my son. But they did. After Adam's death. Three days after Adam was, after Adam's death, three days after, after he died, after they murdered him, I caught Adam Young right here at the Kroger parking lot. He was in his Mustang, his wife's Mustang. He was loading groceries in the trunk, and I was in my little bitty Chevy S10 pickup truck. I pulled up there, and I pinned him right against the bumper. And granted, he was under duress, but by damn, I had to do what I had to do as a mother to find out what happened to my son. So I jumped out there and tell, I told him, I said, look, you're going to tell me what happened to my son, or you're going to wind up the same way my son is dead, because I'm going to put you in that trunk, and that's what you're going to happen to you. So he was under duress by, by threat by me, and I'll tell you, I'm guilty. I'll take my sentence if they want to fucking prosecute me. I don't care. Go ahead. But I got to the truth of the matter. He plainly admitted we got the wrong boy. In case of mistaken identity. I'm so sorry, man. We got the wrong boy. Now, uh, tell me about when he was quote unquote found. They said they served him lunch. All right. At noon. Adam was fine. Said he didn't want his lunch. So they left it on the chuck hole. I got proof of this. I got pictures of it. 
30 minutes later, they come back to, to gather the plate up. Okay. And that's when they found Adam hanging from the metal grate inside the, the drunk tank door. Inside the door. Dead. Yet the plate was still in the chuck hole, even though he was supposed to stepped up on the chuck hole to tie the damn pants that he that he actually tore, supposedly, you know, off himself and tied up there and hung himself with. Yeah, after he ripped out two inch rebar. After he ripped out, yeah, three three rods of two inch rebar. Which I can show you that too. I got the proof. That's what they claim. But I know my son was strong. But he wasn't that damn strong. Shit. Get real about it now. Oh my goodness. Now let me tell you, Adam must have hung himself three times. Because, uh. <laughs> yeah. At 1230, uh, Adam Younger and, uh, the trustee claims that he found Adam. He cut him down, secured the scene, went running, got Sheriff Dobbs to tell him there's, there's been a suicide, supposedly, in our jail. There's a death. There's a death. Death of an inmate. Well, Dobbs calls the EMS. All right? Dobbs and the EMS supervisor, who I spoke with at, the, at his office, claimed that they cut Adam down. All right? And they got there at 10 minutes. They, they, got, they got there at 10 minutes to 12. Okay, because they're only like three minutes away. All right? Uh, tried life-saving measures, supposedly. Okay? Which they didn't even uh, remove the obstacle around his neck, where they tied the pant leg around his neck to portray him that he hung himself. They didn't even remove that. And according to an EMS specialist... Several of them stated that they tried emergency life saving. Well... Nobody cut the pant it, leg off his neck. Nobody... Yeah, yeah, nobody untied the pant leg that they tied on there to try to give him emergency... Nobody okay, then at one, then at one forty, according to uh, Acres and Dobbs, uh, Dobbs Acres met Dobbs outside the sheriff's department because he just heard about it and he just got there. Okay, the doors were all locked down because they had a, a dead a dead body in the in the jail, so it took them a little while to get inside the jail. Okay, and uh, they were the ones that cut him down. They went to cut him down and tried emergency, and tried emergency life saving measures, which didn't succeed. So, within almost an hour's time, several people. several different entities claimed that they cut my son down. So, how come my son emergency life commit suicide, hang himself three different times, and kill himself and succeed all three times? See, they can't they can't keep their lives straight. They're not covering their tracks. Yeah. But this is my son. After the, after they found him, after they murdered him, this is how he looked. The beating, the bruising that they instilled upon him. These are the pictures of him. These are what he looked like after they murdered him. All the bruising on him everywhere all over his body because they beat him with handcuffs while holding him in a strangulation hole around his neck which you can plainly see on this one a lot more better around his neck instead of him being hung with a v-shape going up his neck like it's supposed to be if you're actually hung to death and that was pointed out to me by an expert witness out of park hills the corner there just like this is going straight around his neck it's not in a V shape going up his neck. Yeah. We own a place out in, uh, right out here in the county, right outside of Park Bluff, okay. in Fletchville. After they murdered Adam, they stalked us. The cops would sit outside our house at all hours of the night. They had no reason to be out there. Okay, this is way out in the country. <laughs> it's like nine miles out of town. And uh, they followed me. They oh, harassed me. They 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 sneak up on our property. That hell, they actually burn our trailer out. I mean, my God. What? I don't know what. They're just vigilantes. I mean, they're they're terrorists. That's all. Yeah. And when they found out that she had told me that they had showed up there, they went to her job at Casey's down on the south side and told Tracy Nelson is her name now that uh, if she spoke to me again or made another damn statement, that they was gonna kill her and her kids too. So now she can't even talk to me. She's scared to death. According to the eyewitness. She's seen my son look exactly like this as they were dragging his limp, lifeless body with two other witnesses standing there beside her that are all too scared to come forth. 
and tell the truth because they've already been threatened that they're going to fucking be killed. Excuse my language. Their children will be killed in front of them and then they will be killed. By the cops. By the cops of Butler County. Enough is enough and too much is just damn ugly. And now, you did file suit, um, a wrongful death suit. Under the uh, pretense of what right. they claimed of, of had of committing suicide by hanging, which was a lie. And I have contacted the insurance company and told them this, okay, that it's a lie. They and lied. They defrauded out of money. They're defrauding them out of their money. And they need to investigate this damn corrupt. Actually, the insurance company went out of business. Who'd have thought? Huh? Yeah. But we just want justice. That's all we want. That's all we want. We want justice for Adam and all the other people that they're out here wrongly doing. Because it was our son yesterday. Whose son is it today? And is it going to be your son tomorrow? Well, yeah. I can't give up. If I give up, we'll fight. We'll fight for anybody. For Adam, for no all of them, shame. for the ones that they're gonna kill. We quit. Nothing happened. I can't. Doesn't get any That's better. That's not in me. That's not in me. I'm, I'm in it to win it. I'm here. I'm demanding justice for my son, Adam. That's all there is to it. And I'm not gonna quit till I get it. Got to stop. So, Dobbs, your days are numbered. And you can take that to the bank. That's and I want that put in there. Okay. That will be put in there. Okay. If, any, if nothing else does, that yeah. has to be put in there.